Attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and thank you for joining our introductory webinar on low frequency electromagnetics using ANSYS Maxwell. My name is Brian Miller and I'm pleased to be joined today by my colleague Joel Thacker, one of our senior applications engineers at WILD, and also David Twyman, an electromagnetic specialist at ANSYS UK. In the next half an hour or so, um, we hope to cover a range of aspects regarding electromagnetics. Uh, first of all, for any of you who are not familiar with wild analysis, I'll provide a very brief overview. I will then pass over to Joel to introduce the ANSYS electromagnetic solutions, and then he will dive into more detail with ANSYS Maxwell, um, covering a few applications and general features. After a summary, we'll then have a Q&A session and indeed, if you have any questions whilst watching the webinar, you can easily post those in the questions panel within the GoToMeeting dialog. So just to introduce WILD, um, we're a specialist advanced engineering services company. Uh, we've been around now for over 30 years, and we focus on um, the distribution and support of ANSYS, which is a general purpose solution for structural mechanics, fluid dynamics, and electromagnetic simulation, among other um, areas. In addition to ANSYS, we also focus on simulation solutions which are complementary, such as FlowNex for 1D flow simulation, Plaxis for advanced soil modeling, and then Deform and Mold Flow for the uh, prediction of manufacturing processes. We also have a range of other software, which again is complementary for the optimization of problems. Um, Space Claim, which indeed is now an ANSYS product for the quick uh, generation and modification of geometry. And then MathCAD and ReliaSoft, which is for our statistical uh, and reliability aspects of our business. I will now hand you over to Joel, who will go into more detail about ANSYS Thanks, Ryan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I go into ANSYS Maxwell specifically, I just want to highlight the fact that ANSYS itself has an entire electromagnetics software suite that caters to different physics groups, industries, and uh, analytical needs. So whether you're looking at gigabit communication, high frequency analysis, low frequency analysis, uh, parasitic analysis, or even signal strength and signaling integrity, ANSYS has a solution for you within its electromagnetics package. Today specifically, we're going to be talking about ANSYS Maxwell, <clears throat> which is uh, a low frequency electromagnetic solver. It's used widely in capacitors and motor design in sensing equipment also. One of the questions uh, we get asked quite frequently is, how do I know uh, my application or my analysis is a low frequency analysis type? Um, what is the cutoff, I guess, between low frequency and high frequency? And it really is application dependent, but it's also the fundamental difference between um, Maxwell as a solver and HFSS, which is the high frequency solver from ANSYS. Um, Maxwell has a quasi-static approximation, whereas HFSS solves the full wave equation. And by quasi-static approximation, I mean um, the characteristic length of either um, the model, well, the model that you're um, interested in is 20 times less than the wavelength. Um, that is involved in the analysis. So that's a general rule of thumb that we go by to you know, ca categorize a low frequency analysis versus a high frequency analysis. Okay, a little bit about Maxwell. Um, it is a 2D or a 3D solver. Some of our clients prefer working in the 2D environment um, simply because um, they're analysis and the solutions uh, work better in that environment. The typical example is um, lengthy conducting wires um, over transmission lines. That's probably best solved first in a 2D analysis where you're looking at the fields uh, on the cross section before you move over to a 3D analysis. It's important to note over here 
that if you do run a 3D analysis, you can section along an arbitrary plane and move on to a 2D analysis straight from there. So you're not having to uh, re, you know, reapply your boundary conditions or reapply your CAD model, if you will. It is an FEA approach uh, to solving the Maxwell's equations, uh, which means you need boundary conditions um, and you need initial conditions for a steady state and transient analysis. The types of analysis available within Maxwell include static, um, magnetic and electric fields, oscillating fields, and also time varying uh, electric and magnetic fields. So um, starting at the top, a magnetostatic analysis will solve for your DC currents coming off from electric, um, sorry, coming off from conductors, from magnets, uh, external magnets or even permanent magnets. Eddy currents um, for any oscillating currents that you have within conductors, we can account for core loss um, and so, you know, it's, it's quite widely used for induction heating also. Transient analysis within the magnetic solvers is a full transient solver so it accounts for motion as well as time varying effects. And on the electric side we've got electrostatic uh, which is, uh, you know, it, it solves for the scalar potential uh, based on charge distribution and you've got periodic varying fields based on uh, DC and AC conduction. Okay, a few applications here where Maxwell has been used. Uh, this is an application from High and I Heavy Industries in Bulgaria um, where they were looking at uh, modeling power transformers. The important thing over here to note is that uh, High and I weren't only using Maxwell in isolation, they were using Maxwell in conjunction with other ANSYS um, solvers. So you were getting the EM fields that were, that were being linked to structural fields to see what the response was in the structure also. Um, also as you can see, um, it, you know, it was a great business benefit to High and I because um, it drove down costs and it increase efficiency by 15%, which is always a good thing. Another application is um, an Italian university racing team. Um, they were redesigning their motor and again ANSYS uh, Maxwell was used in a parametric sense to vary geometries and boundary conditions uh, quite easily. Okay, so those are industry applications. What I'm going to do right now is run through the solvers um, and just show you how the solvers work um, based on some simple examples. So looking at the magnetostatic solver first, we look at a switch reluctance motor and I'm going to demonstrate how we can build um, CAD models from a library, from a user-defined library or even from um, the standard inbuilt libraries within ANSYS Maxwell. We're also going to um, model the coils within the motor as stranded coils, which again is a time-saving um, effort, really. So, if we were to start Maxwell, this is what the window looks like. You can see that it's a clean window-style uh, GUI. It's all mouse um, button clicks, really. Um, so, if we were to draw our rotor, we'd go to our primitives, our user-defined primitives, and we can either have primitives that we've generated, but in this case we're going to use a standard primitive, um, sorry, a standard uh, function, uh, which is the SRM core. And we've inputted some values for the geometric definitions. So that could be the number of poles or the core length, um, you know, the total, uh, the, the embrace, for example. Once we've defined that, we've got a 3D CAD model uh, ready to be analyzed. So like I said before, um, you can build in your own um, user-defined libraries CAD templates or you can use one of Maxwell's uh, existing templates. Uh, once we've got the geometry and the coil set up, um, the details of which are given in, in that window over there, um, we can move on to the boundary conditions and the excitations. So in this case, we've got eight coils, so we've got eight excitations. And each excitation, each coil has 
um, a total current of 3,000, uh, yeah, 3.7 kiloamps moving through it. And note it's a stranded coil. Each coil is a stranded coil. Once we've got our excitations, uh, we can also set up results that could either be contour plots or rectangular plots um, to monitor different variables as the solution is running or at the end of the solution. I want to mention over here also, going back to the geometry, uh, that within Maxwell there is uh, a geometry engine that comes with Maxwell. So you can build up your geometries from scratch, from vertices, from lines, from faces, or uh, you can import uh, CAD models from Design Modeler if you're an ANSYS user already or um, if you've got other CAD packages like Solid Edge or Autodesk Inventor, those, um, those models can also be bought into Maxwell very easily. Okay, one thing I haven't talked about so far is mesh generation and that's because uh, mesh generation within ANSYS Maxwell is solver controlled. By that I mean the solver is smart enough to remesh when and where is required within the domain, within the electromagnetic domain. It, uh, we refer to it as the automatic adaptive meshing and the key word is adaptive. How does it actually work? So. You've got your boundary conditions, you've got your geometry, you've set up your initial conditions, you set up an initial mesh. Well, the solver sets up an initial mesh. It solves the EM field based on this initial mesh. So in the case of a magnetostatic analysis, we know that del dot B has to equal zero analytically. In reality, however, that's not going to happen because, well, this is a numerical simulation, there's always going to be some error involved. The energy associated with that error is summed up over the entire domain and that is that energy is compared to the total energy present within the domain and that's represented as a percentage error. If the percentage error is throughout the entire domain is acceptable um, based on a number we prescribe so it's usually about you know 0.1 percent or 1 percent even in some cases then the solver uh, moves on to calculating the outputs so basically simulation has ended. If, on the other hand, this percentage error criteria has not been reached, the solver goes back to the regions that, you know, where this criteria has failed and remeshes in those regions and refines the mesh in those regions. So, the end of the solution really is achieved when either your percentage error is achieved or your maximum number of iterations has been reached. The key point over here is that mesh generation is not only automatic but it's also adaptive. What that means implicitly is that any analyst doing an electromagnetics analysis is not spending time worrying about you know uh, how good their mesh is. They're not having to do uh, mesh refinement studies and mesh independent studies because the solver is automatically taking care of that for you and that's a massive benefit. You can move on to you know post-processing and boundary condition setup. Okay, once we've actually hit the solve button, the solver will tell us uh, what's actually happening with the mesh. So on this example over here, you can see coils one, uh, the eight coils. It tells us the number of tets that are present um, and also uh, the minimum and maximum volumes of these tets. And same goes for the, uh, you know, the rotor and the stator. So if that's the initial mesh we started with, at some further iteration down the line, it's got a modified mesh and you should be seeing um, a more refined mesh. The key point again over here is that it's refined it in regions that really matter uh, where the action is, so as to speak. If you looked at the percentage er uh, error, uh, the energy error percentage, um, that's clearly falling as the number of passes or the number of iterations um, increases and that's exactly we, what we want. Once we've solved the simulation, like I said, we're back to post-processing. Um, and post-processing can happen on contour plus, through animations if it's a transient analysis, or even through uh, rectangular plots. I want to mention over here that um, a user is not restricted and limited to just a simple, uh, you know, inbuilt variables that come within ANSYS Maxwell, so, you know, current density and, um, you know, electric field, etc. If, for example, you 
you're working in an industry where um, I don't know uh, current density squared is a value or a variable that you care about you can easily set up a new function um, called current density squared um, and you can monitor that again throughout the solution or as a post-processing function. Okay, then uh, moving on to the eddy current solver. Um, I've got a, a simple example over here of a copper coil, a copper stranded coil, uh, heating up a metal plate. The metal plate at the bottom, uh, the, the, the bulk conductivity of the metal plate is temperature dependent. So what we're going to do over here is link ANSYS Maxwell to a CFD solver, an ANSYS CFD solver which is fluent, and um, obtain uh, the temperature distribution uh, on the plate. So what's actually happening here? So first step the, in ANSYS Ma uh, Maxwell, uh, the EM field is solved. Uh, it induces a current within the metal plate. That's what you can see on the contour plot there, on the vector graph. The calculated ohmic loss is 8.3 watts initially. That loss is mapped onto the CFD solver. The CFD solver runs through its analysis and you, it, you get a corresponding temperature uh, field. So you can see that there's a buoyancy as associated due to that heat and the metal itself heats up. That new temperature now, that new temperature um, field is taken back to ANSYS Maxwell, is taken back to the EM field and ANSYS Maxwell will solve again but this time it's got an updated temperature field so the bulk conductivity has also been updated. It runs through the analysis again and you get an updated ohmic loss of 8.9 watts. This can be automated, this um, this process of sending um, information to CFD and back from CFD into EM can be automated um, to the point where um, the solver stops when a steady state ohmic loss or a steady state um, temperature field has been reached. Okay, uh, looking at some transient simulation characteristics now, we've got a simple example of core material characterized for nonlinear BH and BP characteristics. I've got an increasing voltage, uh, three voltages applied to those coils, um, and they're out of phase. So when we look at the core loss, the core loss is also uh, increasing, uh, and then it, it, it levels off. But looking at the vector plot, uh, what you're seeing over there is the magnetic field, uh, which moves from, I guess, from the left to the right um, of, uh, of the system. And that's because uh, the magnetic field is following, you know, um, the out of phase voltage versus time graphs that you see on the top left corner. So it's a full transient analysis that's taking into account time varying effects within the system. Okay, a simple DC conduction example um, over here is a copper assembly and I'm introducing electric current um, at these points, at these phases, and I've got a sink through which uh, current exits. And that is our typical current density vector plot um, that most people are interested in. And that's what you get. I want to talk to you a bit about multi-physics uh, analysis. In this case over here, we've got six-leg IGT, IGBT um, assembly, but we're going to be looking at a simple, uh, we're going to be looking at just one leg of the six legs. Um, these applications are usually used for, well, this, this type of assembly is usually used for fast switching applications. What that implicitly means is that you've got high current moving through the bond wires, which leads to thermal stress. Again, the bond wire uh, conductivity is temperature dependent in this example. So just to run through what's what in this model, we've got our terminals, we've got our diodes, we've got IGBTs, and we've got the bond wires which we're interested in. Okay, so how does this actually work? We first solve the EM field within ANSYS Maxwell, and if you zoom into the current density pl uh, contour plot, you can see the current density on the bond wires is at the maximum. The losses are exported to ANSYS Mechanical. 
answers mechanical then uses those losses, that ohmic loss, um, and it solves for a thermal analysis. And you can see again um, that on the temperature plot, the bond wires have the highest temperature reading. I think it's about 80 degrees. That temperature reading is sent back to ANSYS uh, Maxwell, where the bulk conductivity is now updated. And Maxwell updates the losses back um, based on this new temperature data. Again, we can automate this process such that, you know, um, information is sent to and from Maxwell till a steady state solution is reached. Once we've got a steady state um, or equilibrium temperature or ohmic loss solution, we can take that result, those results to static structure where we can perform a structural analysis. And then over here what we're looking at is the deformation um, and stresses on the bond wires. So you can see um, maximum stresses are at the connection points. I've spoken about um, coupling ANSYS Maxwell to CFD and FEA solvers within ANSYS, but ANSYS Maxwell can also uh, link up with the other packages within um, the electromagnetic suite within ANSYS. So for example, um, you can be analyzing a component such as a motor within ANSYS Maxwell and then use that, um, that data or those results and feed that into a simpler um, model. A simpler model is a network analysis model. So you're not just limited to, you know, um, moving information from Maxwell to FEA or to CFD, but you can also use it for a complete electronics package design, basically, uh, at the system level, um, at the component level, or even look at parasitics um, via the Q3D uh, module. Other capabilities within ANSYS Maxwell include nonlinear relative permeability. Um, this is quite important for some applications. We, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we can have our own expressions during pre- and post-processing, which we can monitor. Access Maxwell also takes into account skin depth effect for eddy currents, for transient phenomena, or for proximity effects. So what you see over here are two conductors, uh, two current carrying conductors in close proximity, and you can see the magnetic field when the currents are in the same direction and in opposite directions. And last of all, um, I want to mention that ANSYS Maxwell has optometrics. It's an agile module to ANSYS Maxwell, and it's mainly used for parametric studies, optimization studies, or sensitivity analysis. So looking at a simple example of optimization, we've got a puck magnet attractor. Um, and what we're trying to do is uh, optimize the force, the electromagnetic force, um, between the, the, the puck magnet and the metal plate at the bottom. So initially, um, the puck sits at a height of one millimeter above the plate, and that results in a force of 0 0.381 newtons. We want to drive that down to 0 0.25 newtons. So what we've done is set up a variable called a move variable, and that's basically um, a variable that has a range of zero or one, 0 to 1 millimeter. And we've got another variable called the cost function variable, which is the difference between the calculated force, electromagnetic force, and the target force, which is 0 0.25. So when that force, when that, when that value goes to 0, that's the ideal location for the puck to be sitting at. So when we run the analysis, um, we get this a, a table uh, that tells us what you know the variable, the move variable is, and what the resulting difference is. Graphically, that can be represented that way, um, and you can see that the difference, uh, our target value of zero, is reached at somewhere at 450 micrometers. Um, if you look at the force versus air gap chart, again you can see that um, 250. Uh, millinewtons is reached at again 450 micrometers. One thing to take away from here is that we've told the um, we've told ANSYS Maxwell that the puck could be moved anywhere between 0 to 1 millimeter. As you can see over here, ANSYS Maxwell has clearly found a sweet spot uh, very early on and it 
it's not going to waste iterations, you know, looking at um, the design space that's away from the sweet spot. So all the effort and all the energy is basically um, is spent um, looking at the region where um, the cost function was minimalized. Again, that's a good use of resources. I'm going to hand over to Brian now, who's going to summarize for us. Okay, thank you, Joel. So hopefully in the last 30 minutes or so, we've been able to show some of the principal features of Ansys Maxwell. Uh, first of all, Ansys Maxwell is easy to use. It has a very clean GUI, and as Joel's mentioned, there's lots of options for both importing CAD geometry and also creating your own. It is very much based on a, a type of analysis setup so that, you know, depending on whether you're doing a magneto or electrostatic analysis, it will guide you through accordingly with the right options. And also there's a number of templates to further simplify the setup of the model um, involving CAD libraries, uh, material libraries and so forth. One of the things we've obviously emphasized this afternoon is the adaptive meshing, and that's because it, it has two major benefits. First of all, it takes a lot of the pain away in terms of setting up the model in the first place, in terms of looking at the initial and, and refined mesh design. And also, it, it represents a very efficient use of resources because it essentially runs a model with the right number of elements. Something we haven't had a chance to mention too much this afternoon is the parallel computing uh, capabilities of ANSYS Maxwell. You can run it as a parallelized solution. It is very efficient, and therefore you're able to make the most of your latest hardware. And also, we've touched upon, or well, only really touched upon, the array of capabilities in, available within Maxwell. This includes both a range of static and transient solvers. And obviously, one very powerful uh, aspect of Antis Maxwell it is it's built on the overall Antis platform. Uh, this platform has a multitude of solvers, acoustic, structural, and fluid solvers. And therefore, it is ideal for any type of problem involving multiple physics, as Joel has shown you. And indeed, more and more in industry, as we see we're going to more of a systems-based approach to product design, the ability to model multiple physics at once is, is key. It's becoming increasingly important to get a vir true virtual prototype of your system. And finally, we have, as a with, through the Optometrics module, a very neat, efficient, and easy-to-use optimization capability to, again, further automate and refine your designs. So just before we take questions, I would just like to mention a follow-up ANSYS webinar, which is taking place on the uh, 25th of February. Uh, this webinar is going to be run by ANSYS, and it drills down further into the use of ANSYS Maxwell, in this case, focusing on actuators. Um, there's a link there, as you see on the screen. And we'll also follow up by sending you this link by email later on, where you can look at the uh, agenda for the uh, webinar, and also have the opportunity to sign up to watch that too. Obviously, if there's anything we haven't covered today, um, which you're interested in, then you can contact us easily using the uh, details on the screen. Um, we have various social uh, links with Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. But of course, at any time, please pick up the phone and ask us um, to help you further with Maxwell. OK. So now just look at questions that have been posted. Okay, well, I have a first question here, Joel. Um, it says, um, it's about design modeler. Can you import design modeler geometries into Maxwell? Uh, yes, you definitely can. Um, within the workbench environment, for those of you who are using ANSYS, um, you can drag um, your design modeler directly into ANSYS Maxwell, and any parameters that are set up within design modeler will be taken automatically into ANSYS Maxwell also. Okay, and um, we have another one here um, regarding moving parts. Um, can we, well, can we simulate moving parts in that one? Um, yes, we definitely can simulate moving parts. Uh, the classic example is of a magnet dropping down, uh, you know, a, a tube, a metal tube. Um, it, you know, so that's a full uh, time and space type analysis. We definitely can. Um, I, I don't know if Dave wants to add anything more to that. 
Dave, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so one of the main uses of Maxwell is the is a very easy to use transient solver in there. So this lets us model um, rotary and translational motion, as you often find in um, motors, generators, and actuators. So the transient nature of it lets us look at um, time and motion induced eddy currents as well. So very much motion is a strong point of the of the solver. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks, Dave. Um, another question here. Actually, I think that relates to one of your first slides, Joel, um, regarding the highest frequency Maxwell can simulate. Um, actually, Dave, perhaps you can contribute to this one, too, uh, to build on what Joel mentioned earlier about the highest frequency Maxwell can model. Yeah, that's, that's always a good question as well. Um, okay, so we're, we're not solving all of Maxwell's equations. Um, at the same time, we're solving a, a formulation of all. Um, and choosing a solver. Um, so it's very much an uh, application-based method. Um, so we're either choosing an electric solver or a magnetic solver. So what we have in Maxwell a lot of time is that the electric and magnetic fields are decoupled from one another, whereas, which is fine for low frequency. It's fine for power electronics applications. It's fine for motors, generators, actuators, um, and transformers. Um, we would be using a, a high-frequency structural simulator to um, model devices such as antennas um, and mobile phones um, at much higher frequencies. So I guess the difference is there's, um, there's an overlap. If you start thinking of electrical wavelength instead of frequency, um, it becomes a bit easier to visualize in that probably the electrical wavelength at power electronics frequencies is, is very large. It's you know, hundreds of kilometers, um, much bigger than the anything that we're going to model much bigger than anything that's going to be made, whereas the electrical wavelength um, at antennas and mobile phone frequencies is going to be a lot smaller than a device, so we need to be considering electrical magnetic fields in, a, um, in the same solver. So that's, that's one way to answer that question. Okay. Um, but if we choose applications, go by an application basis, we can't go far wrong. Okay, Dave. Well, actually, to build on that question, we've got another one here about a specific application. Um, this is a, an electrostatic or a pizza electric um, transducer. Um, it's used to oscillate a cantilever. I think it's part of the MEMS um, uh, package. Um, so the transducer operates at 350 kilohertz. Uh, to put you on the spot, I don't know if this is something you can answer over <laughs> straight away, um, do you feel that Maxwell would be the more appropriate solution or, or HFSS? Probably for piezoelectric effects, we'd be looking at some of the traditional elements that we have in um, some of the other ANSYS solvers, probably in the ANSYS mechanical solver. So we'd be choosing those um, tightly coupled elements where the um, material properties can be made a function of the field all in the same same solver, same element. Okay. Well, maybe we'll probably obviously take this more offline and, and drill down further. It sounds like we've obviously got a solution. Yeah. Um, we just have to um, obviously, you know, that's the beauty of ANSYS. So there's lots of options to model these things. So uh, we'll obviously give some more advice afterwards on what's the best solution for this application. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I think actually there's one final one. Um, again, actually, I think somebody's actually jumping the gun here about uh, modeling a solenoid actuator. I think you're going to, well, that's going to be covered in a couple of weeks' time, I think, Dave. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything at this yeah, very, or wait until two weeks' time. Well, yeah, very much so. I mean, that's a, another application that's in the sweet spot for Maxwell. Um, it's designing solenoids and actuators along with motors and generators. So, yeah, maybe, um, maybe come along to the webinar. Um, <laughs> or send an email for if you're interested in doing that further. Yeah. So one of the strengths of using Maxwell is the, the transient solver, so we can include a, an external circuit as a drive circuit to model the, um, to connect to the actuator. Okay. That's great. Okay, I think that's probably all we have time for now. Um, as mentioned before, if there's any questions that haven't been answered this afternoon, or you just want to find out a little bit more about ANSYS Maxwell, or indeed any of the ANSYS solutions, and how they might be appropriate for your uh, for your applications, then.
please get in touch and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.